The federal government declares war on bandits and terrorists, declares Zamfar State a no-fly zone. And INET asked for more polling units ahead of 2023 elections, while Labour State PDP urges INET to prioritise election integrity over polling units, ex units expansion. Well, this is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anacom. The National Security Advisor, retired Major General Babagana Mungono, has said some unnamed non-state actors causing problems in parts of the country have been placed under security surveillance. He said the government would not fold its hands while those involved continue with their nefarious activities. This comes as President Muhammad Buhari declared Zamfir State a no-fly zone following frequent banditry and kidnaps of people in the state. Well, to discuss this with me is retired Air Vice Marshal Femi Badibo and legal practitioner Jide Ulogun. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank for you. Me. Okay, I'm going to start with it's you. Pleasure. Yeah, ABM. Um, the National Security Advisor, Babangara Mungono, uh, said the government would not fold its arms um, while those involved continue with their nefarious activities. Um, is this a wake up call for the government? I mean, after so many abductions, knowing that we've seen so many things happen, people have called on government to rise up and take action over and over again. Was this more like the, the, the straw, the last straw that probably maybe made the government awake to its responsibilities? I guess you may say so, plus the fact that uh, the, the architecture or security architecture has just been tinkered as a result of which we have uh, new players in the field. Um, you'll recall that the Chief of Army Staff went to Bornu the other day and actually gave an ultimatum to the unit there to recapture uh, a certain stronghold that had been taken by the um, militants. And uh, I, I, I thought it was kind of funny that he would give an ultimatum in right there and telling them you'll do one thing or the other. But at the end of the whole um, you know, interaction, the troops actually cheered him. And uh, to my surprise, in less than 32, six hours, they had recovered that particular uh, position. So I guess, you know, there are a lot of issues. Maybe the former service chiefs, um, you know, had, had lived their youthfulness somehow. They made promises that were not being kept. They had always checked themselves. You know, it's easy to go to Asso Rock and promise when the equipment, that men and equipment are not really enough on ground. And then you are moving men from one position to the other and so on. And sometimes we hear when some commanders actually um, go to social media to complain about issues and instead of being heard, are removed and even dealt with and so on. So I, I think, um, you know, the, it's time to do something. I'm only disturbed that they're still giving warning at this time because the tone of the language signifies that they know some of these people. So how long are you going to uh, tolerate or bear with them? I think maybe because they're in the same party or something. But, uh, you know, I, I hope that this time around something positive will be done other than just this one. Interestingly, I was about to ask that same, I was about to pose a question to Mr. Logan saying, I mean, the... Zamfara State Governor sounded more like he had a list of people uh, that he knew were behind these kidnappings, this banditry, and he said that these were the same people that were against the peace process he was trying to implement in the state. So, Barisal Logum, if a governor comes out to say something like, I know the people behind this, is it not the place of the people, uh, you know, backed by the law to say, well, if you have an idea of who these people are, why are we not naming and shaming them? So my question is, what's holding the governor back, or even the uh, national security advisor, from naming and shaming these people? I, I suspect that that might have been caused by political sentiment. You know, the governor is a politician. And you know the roles that major stakeholders play in politics. This is not the first time we're having a scenario like this. Recently, the former deputy governor of Central Bank of Nigeria, Milaifel, came out that he heard Nonsulani 
conversing and identifying some of the sponsors of Boko Haram and rather than investigate deeply and go after these uh, sponsors, the DSS invited him and at a point he claimed he was being harassed. And recall recently also that even far away in the UAE, sponsors of Boko Haram were jailed by the UAE that are not even direct victims of the terrorism going on in Nigeria. How many have we even you know, started investigating in Nigeria? And if you look at the recent trend, it has become difficult for people to believe that the government is not interested in the terrorism going on in Nigeria. I recall that uh, I think in 2012 or thereabout, while the president and commander in chief was still a, a candidate, he said that there are three types of Boko Haram, the criminal Boko Haram, the government Boko Haram, and the insurgent. So we don't know which one exactly is on now, because if you look at the picture we have now by way of perception, it's as if we have the bandits as a pseudo government negotiating with the real government and even dictating to the real government. And we are talking about negotiating whether to pay ransom or not to pay ransom. And the governor of Zamfara has declared that will be shocked if he mentions the names of some of the uh, of, of this, you know, big week behind this terrorism. And if you look at the response of the Arewa Consultative Forum, uh, they, they are claiming that he's embarrassing them. And I wonder why that should be the case. What should happen is that he should be told to go ahead, but he's just an individual. And from his body language and the way he has been expressing himself, he is so concerned. Look at the no flight. Uh, uh, order that the president gave. The governor came out to say that that may not solve the problem mm. of terrorism in Zamfara State, that even this case predates his regime in office. And he has given us an insight that illegal mining to have the criminality in that region. So the big question now is, is the government in control of the management of our resources in the country? Or you'll be surprised, like the governor has expressed himself, that the people behind all this are very powerful and influential. Don't forget that even during the regime of the former president, good luck, Ebele Jonathan, he said it himself, that he has cabals in his government. So these cabals are probably still around in Nigeria because like, and like it has been mentioned this evening, some of us are surprised why with the caliber of the president we have as a retired general, as one time military head of state, with all the accolades he has earned in the past, it has become difficult to deal with the terrorism. Rather than dealing with it, it's ever growing and subjecting the military apparatus that is not even primarily uh, responsible for internal security hmm. to appear to be almost overwhelmed. I, I was certainly, it, it, it's embarrassing. I, I want to pose this question again. Now to... we are claiming that we, we, cannot, we cannot go after the bandits because they wear military camouflage. How do they get the military camouflage? They have rocket launchers. How do they get the rocket launchers? They have, you know, a, a vehicles that are equipped with sophisticated ammunition. How do they get this ammunition? And, the... and our own military are complaining of, of not being well equipped. And like the elder rightly mentioned this evening, those who complain, rather than listen to them and see how to, how to be of help to them, they were being castigated even, you know, shifted from office. So you can see the morale of even those who should be engaging the insurgency winning by the day. About 536 withdrew from service around July 2020. About 127 young ones withdrew this, this year. So where are, we are, we are we heading for? Let me come back to ABM because this, I'm sure that all of these questions, we need to pose them back to him because he's been uh, a serving... Uh, member of the Air Force before he retired. So let's take this question back to him. Um, what could be more powerful than the most powerful person in this country, the commander in chief of all of the armed forces? I, I'm thinking of what could be more powerful than that, except you're a god or you're Zeus. I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, but then that is the most powerful person in this country as we speak. But the most powerful person is unable to bring to book these said powerful forces who are behind the insecurity and the unrest that we're experiencing in almost every part of this country. So I ask you, sir, 
What could be more powerful than the president? And why does it seem so difficult to bring these people to justice? Um, the devil is more powerful than the president. <laughs> And as I'm sure you've had people <laughs> post a few times on social media, there are more devils in this country than there are in hell. You see, the situation is, is I've had, I'm sure you've heard people say, if you want to dine with the devil, use a long stick mm -hmm. or lose a long spoon. The question I always pose, who has ever seen the devil's spoon? The devil has a much longer spoon than you can ever have. Now, when you're looking for political office, and you go to bed with strange fellows. At the end of the day, you are the boss, but there are certain people you cannot touch. Because when some of these people come to help you, they use all kinds of dirty tricks and devices. And when these things are exposed, you are involved. So you have individuals around the corner who like this, you know, the statements tell you that they know these people. They are trying to negotiate with these people. But because these people want absolute power, you're not giving them absolute power. Then the, whatever negotiations you arrive at, it falls through. So this question of last warning, last warning, until they deal with somebody, expose somebody, arrest somebody, and let, us know what, and let us know what is going on. It's going to continue. You see, if you look at Dampara, when Governor Yari was there, it took a while before we really realized how much illegal mining was going on in that state. And once that happened, and this is not unconnected with the Chinese people who came to Nigeria, just like I talked of devils, there are good Chinese and there are very bad Chinese. The good pioneers we are seeing in Lagos in the Sadsi capitals, they're signing agreements with the governors. The bad Chinese are in our rural areas. They're setting up industry, they're mining, they're doing all kinds of things. And this is why the issue of the no-fly zone there comes in. Hmm. A lot of the weapon that you are seeing, the motorcycles, the desert bikes, and so on, they're not coming to Lagos ports, they're not coming to Lumen. They're coming through some airports in the north, either Niger, Chad, and so on. And they are being flown by helicopter into Sambisa and some of these areas. Local people have reported helicopters, white helicopters, either coming in to drop equipment or coming to, or, or air dropping foodstuff and so on. But the other, so that, they, that's one area of getting all their arms, ammunition, and equipment. The other end is that some of the illegal mine, uh, res the resources being mined illegally, they're also not being brought to Lagos ports to take out. They're flying them out. So helicopter comes and takes these things. They settle the big people, including traditional rulers, and they take them out. And you see, once you start that kind of business, you have, let's say, one leader. But before you know what's happening, you have 20, 30 smaller leaders. And every, because the, the, the gains are not being shared equally. Hmm. And that's how come, or maybe the leaders die or something. So instead of one man, you suddenly have 10 sub, sub lieutenants who become leaders. Hmm. And it just met a process. And this has gone all over the north. They first started, yes, some people came in, they were rustling cattle. But a lot of these things were happening now is to just drive people away from local governments so that they can feel free and do the illegal business they're doing there. And that's why, you know, when you now come up with a no-fly zone, it means that the whole world knows that you're not supposed to fly into that area. And hopefully, if we can position either anti-aircraft guns or attack, uh, attack aircrafts, we can shoot down one of two of these illegal aircrafts. But if we do it without the no-fly zone, then the whole world will come down on that ship. But now that they have done this, hopefully we can shoot down one or two. And, Interesting. Um, we'll begin to see some results. Let's take a look at the speech by um, Baba Ganat Mungono on this particular issue. And I'm going to pinpoint some um, strong terms that he made while he uh, was addressing the press there. Let's, let's take a look at that video and then we'll come back and talk more. Now, all non-state actors that have been causing problems 
for the innocent peoples, not just in Zamfara State or the Northwest Zone, but also the Northeast and other parts of the country in the South-South have been placed under surveillance by the intelligence agencies. We've had a lot of reports coming in collusion with people from all walks of life. While the federal government is not averse to the application of non-kinetic means to resolve this problem, His Excellency the President has approved based on our recommendation, the imposition and enforcement of a ban on all mining activities in Zamfara State with immediate effect until further notice. He has directed the Honorable Minister of Defense and the National Security Advisor to deploy massive military and intelligence assets to restore normalcy to that part of the country. He has also approved that Zamfara State be declared a no-fly zone with immediate effect. Now, we were unable to play the whole thing, but I want to take your attention to, and this question goes for both gentlemen. Um, he spoke about the federal government not being averse to the application of non-kinetic means to resolve the, the security issue in the country, he said the government won't hesitate to use the fullest of its kinetic means to restore normalcy in the country. So I'm coming back to you, ABM. You, I'll start with you. What do you think he means by this? Because it sounds very stern. Well, um there are certain declarations that you make about a group of individuals. And one, I mean, the most uh, dangerous one is to declare them um, terrorists, you know, enemies of the state. Once you do that, you can go in there with maximum firepower. Um, until you do that, and that's why you'll find that they're always trying to use bandits, trying to use one name or the other or something, but they don't want to use the, the, the big word on that and so on. So, um, and then, you know, the, you, you do not stay outside an area and continue to just bombard and shell the area because you know that there are also civilians, there are going to be a lot of corrupted damage, and so on. So the kind of weapons you use are mostly small arms and directed at, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one engagement, at least close combat and so on, which is why, to some extent, the civilian uh, damage to civilians has been reduced. But once you declare the whole area a dangerous area, you will, hopefully will be able to get a lot of civilians out of that. And then you'll be able to pinpoint areas where you can go and uh, and they use maximum power and so on. But the other thing is that there are people who are also helping, quote and unquote, by going behind the scene to try to talk, to negotiate with these people. In an ideal situation, um, no self-respecting government negotiates with terrorists. But we've seen a lot of things happening and there's been a lot of confusion as to who is talking to who and who is giving who money. Uh, and so on. But I'd like to say here that officially it's not the Nigerian government, it's not the Nigerian military, but those who are doing it um, have to be careful that they don't turn this thing into a business as we are seeing. I mean, because if you kidnap a set of students, I mean, three, four sets of students within a month and release them immediately at a little negotiation, it has become business. <laughs> and a very lucrative business for that matter. And we're setting a very bad precedence. So even those who are claiming to negotiate on behalf of government have to get government's approval and have an understanding on what is going on. But like I've said at other forums, the proper thing is that by now, Nigeria, between the police and the military, will have trained proper negotiators. There'll be psychologists, there'll be psychiatrists, there'll be all kinds of experts. 
who will be able to sit with these people and talk to them? You don't just pick anybody to go and talk with terrorists. You know, you are talking on one level, they're talking on the other level. The other thing is, nobody is talking about the huge sums of money that is going into that area. There's no way that you, you take 10 million naira to the bank today, the SSS will query you how well you got the money. Exactly. So how come you're giving hundreds of millions to people in the, in the jungle? You look at them, look at the shoes they're wearing and everything, apart from the weapons they're holding. There's nothing about those people that show that they know how to handle uh, 20 million naira. Okay? So obviously, they're working for people. And at the end of the day, it is these people that we need to identify. And don't, don't forget that 2023 is around the corner. Mm. People are beginning to ask, look, the only tool of campaign that Nigerian politicians, the big boys know, is cash. You understand? Mm. Raw cash. And that's what they, some of them are actually doing behind the scene through all these kidnappings and things that we've seen. Okay. Let me go back to Mr. Logo. Now, Mr. Babagana Mongono also mentioned the fact that um, the federal government was not going to stand by and watch some non-state actors create a state of panic in the country. Um, and I'm thinking, that's already the situation in the country. There's been panicking, there's been killings. I mean, so many things have happened and the government seemed to be asleep. So, I mean, what's the, what's the difference now, apart from the fact that they're declaring a no-fly zone and all of that, why should we be um, sh certain? What would give us that sh assurance or surety that the government will keep its word? Because this is not the first time they're talking tough. I think sometimes that um, when some of these comments are passed by our leaders in code, they do not make reference to the constitution. If you look at section 14, of section two of the Nigerian constitution 1999 as amended, it says that the security and the welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. So how the government achieves that is not the business of the people or the business of government, all right? And if you look at section 15 of section five of the same constitution, it says that the state shall abolish corruption and abuse of office. So when you now see the same government being apologetic towards criminal, you must be worried. So there's likely to be a collusion somewhere. And that's why I quite agree with the ABM who has brilliantly you know, tutored us this evening. Some people may be making so much money from from, from, from these businesses, and unfortunately, you are promising, you are advising us not to go into panic mode. Who is not in panic mode in Nigeria now? I mean, it's a, very, it's a, it's a simple test. Even the railway line from Kaduna to Abuja is suffering from shortage of patronage. People are apprehensive, kidnapping everywhere, killings of traditional rulers, rape, different kinds of crimes. And I listen to the president himself and the commander in chief of the armed forces claiming that when he came in in 2015, he inherited Boko Haram, or now he's dealing with banditry and other crimes. So are we now saying that there is improvement or that things are getting worse? And you see those you, can, you may classify as psychopaths telling us that security situation right now is better than it was in 2015. And you have heard the Sultan of Sokoto coming out to scream. Whether it is because of, you know, a mismanaging our resources or taking this advantage of Nigeria, if you allow me to use that expression, the business of the government is to make the people prosper. Why won't we be the capital of poverty if we have a condoning government? It's so sickening that we will go and take photographs with bandits. And is that not a ridicule? to the intelligence apparatus of the military and security agents. So we now claim you don't know where they are. So you kidnap over 200 school pupils and you take them and there's no surveillance. Imagine how do you want people to believe that the, the brilliant young uh, officers that died in the, in, the, in the aircraft going to survey, uh, was it Kagara or which one, recently? was a pure accident. 
So you have a lot of questions to answer. And basically, people are beginning to lose the trust capital that has been reposed in the government to carry out the primary purpose of government. So right now, you now see people resorting to, let me ask a big question. Is it a sheikh that should now be going to, to show us bandits, negotiate with them? We are now, so a governor will come out, no, we are not going to negotiate. And the president and commander in chief will say, we have to go against them with full force. And you don't see that full force. So how can we trust the statement of the president? Hmm. I mean, these are, these are issues that are bothering us. Okay. Uh, well, you must secure the you must secure the land. Okay. And, if, and and lead people towards prosperity. It's not negotiable at all. That is the essence of having a government. All right. Finally, because we have just a minute a minute to go. We have. We have just a minute to go. Finally, what, one thing I want to just put out there. Um, again, Baba Ghana Mungono did say that he, we will not. I would like to say it in his own words. We will not allow this country to drift into a state of failure. Um, with effect from today, um, may, uh, and my, my, my issue there is drift into failure on the line. Um, many critics of this government and security agencies have said that Nigeria is a failed state. Some are saying Nigeria is failing. Some are saying that, you know, um, it's become a country where um, people take action and government cannot deal with them. So really... Um, What's your take on the this? We will no longer allow people to uh, allow the country to drift into failure. Can we say that we are a failed state? We're failing, or maybe we're in a state of shambles? And if care is not taken, we're heading towards that failure. Um, did we lose somebody? All right, Mr. Logan, can you go ahead? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So quickly before we go, because we're out of time. The NSA boss had said that he's, we're trying, they're trying to make sure that we do not drift into a failed, into failure. And I'm asking, are we not already there? Because there are certain critics who have said that Nigeria is a failed state, some say it's failing. I'm asking, are we not already in a state of shambles? Should we not be picking up the pieces instead of just talking about failure in its entirety? I didn't hear that clearly. Oh dear. Well, I want to thank you all for being part of the conversation. Thank you, Julia Logan. Thank you, Air Vice, form, a former Air Vice Marshal, um, but it will all for being part of the conversation. Apologies, the internet connection just went bad. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be talking 2023 elections. Yes, because INEC is pushing for more polling units. We'll be right back after that break. <laughs>